Hi everyone, we are going to wait for a few minutes for people to join and we will start the webinar at probably 12.02. Thanks so much for being here. Once again, we're just going to wait like another minute uh, for everyone to join, and then we'll get started. So thanks for being here and hang tight. All right, I'm doing it. We're going to start. Okay, welcome everybody to this bonus New Mexico Smart Grid Center summer webinar. Um, it's 100% carbon free energy system. Can we still keep the lights on? With Dr. John, all the way from Clarkson University in New York. Um, I'm Brittany Vandewerf, the Communication and Outreach special Specialist for New Mexico Established Program to Stimulate Competitive Research. Uh, New Mexico EPSCOR. EPSCOR is a nationwide program funded by the National Science Foundation. And I'll be your host for today's webinar, along with my partner in crime, Isis Serna, our website administrator, who will be working behind the scenes um, to make it all flow smoothly. So um, a few housekeeping things before I begin. I want to let you know that if you have questions at any point, please type them in the Q&A box, and Isis will politely interrupt Dr. Jean and read them out loud. Um, I also want to take a hot second to tell you about the EPIC webinar training lineup we have for you this fall. In August, we kick off with Dustin Allen, Systems and Network Analyst at the New Mexico State Office, who, we, who will be presenting Python Fundamentals with Data Analysis and Visualization on the 25th from noon to one. Um, if you ever wanted to learn Python, Python now is the time. Uh, then in September, we will hear for, about research from Dr. Juan from um, NMSU School of Engineering, and he is also a new New Mexico Smart Grid Center faculty, faculty hire. Uh, finally, in October, we will learn about the research of Dr. Xiao, at, an assistant professor at New Mexico, New Mexico Tech, Department of Electrical Engineering, and also a new New Mexico Smart Grid Center hire. Uh, registration info can be found on our website, as always. Okay, now that's out of the way. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, um, Dr. Zhang, we, uh, who was recommended by the aforementioned Dr. Wan from uh, NMSU. Dr. Zhang is an assistant professor in the ECE department at Clarkston University. Prior to joining Clarkston in 2020, he was a power systems engineer at GE Global Research Center in New York. There, Dr. Zhang led a GE team to investigate long duration storage for renewable grid integration and participated in design of GE products, including distributed energy resource management system, flexible large power transformers, and converter-based distributed generation. Dr. John earned his PhD from Washington State University in 2016, and his research interests include renewable integration and energy digitalization. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. John. Please begin whenever you are ready. All right, thanks so much. Um, for the introduction here. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Yep. All right, thank you for the introduction again. Um, welcome to this talk here. 
Um, today, I just wanted to talk, share some of my experience of uh, when we are moving towards the 100% carbon-free energy system, can we still keep the lights on? Um, this, is, is, this is very interesting to me. The, the reason is uh, now we are more and more, more and more dependent on the electricity and keeping the lights on is almost the number one priority for our daily life. I just cannot imagine um, we have the lights out. Uh, the experience I had yesterday that we have a, a, the, the storm here yesterday and then um, the electricity supply to the water house was out. And then basically I was not, I, I don't have water supply for four hours. That drove me crazy because I cannot cook and cannot take a shower. So that just shows how important the electricity um, to our daily life. So given that background, I just want to share a little bit of my view on this topic and hope that I will give you some information. You can get something here. Um, before I talk about the, uh, how to keep the lights on, I just want to quickly um, describe my background here. Um, uh, Brittany already introduced my um, experience here. Just want to give you a little bit more details here. So basically, I got my PhD from Washington State University. And then uh, my whole the PhD program was about outage for both the transmission grid and also distribution grid. And also I have been working on the GE uh, distribution management system for the smart city test path um, before I graduated. So they, because of that, and then I very naturally, and then I, I transfer, uh, you know, to, to GE to continue working on that direction. But um, surprisingly, after I went to GE, you know, my all, all my focus was on renewable integration and also the product design to improve the greater resiliency. Um, the resiliency is almost equivalent to, to say, we need to keep the lights on uh, under the extreme events. Basically, resiliency is, is mainly to keep the lights on. So in that part, in the week, I continue to work on some of the technology related to outage. Then in 2020, the, uh, in 2020 I came to Clarkson. Um, I have been focusing on the the, the data analytics. So basically now we have more and more data and how to use the data to, um, for the decision-making power system. Um, seems like you, you guys will have the next um, seminar on the uh, Python learning for the data and the, and the analytics and the visualization. I would say, I wish I could be the student here so I can have the chance to, to learn, but unfortunately I cannot, but I, I, I hope that you, you can, you can you can learn that and then you can you can see that what we are doing here in the power grid also quite rely on the data analytics and the visualization and then the other part is i also focus on the grid operation under the uncertainty uh latter part is more about driven by the renewable integrated into the grid you your your renewable is very uncertain means you have a lot of variability your forecasting has a lot of uncertainty how do you operate your grid uh, consider uncertainty. That's another um, direction that I'm, I'm focusing on. But definitely, I'm also considering, uh, I'm also continuing the work of outage related work there and the storage related work that have what I have been working on um, since day one while I was in the PhD program. So basically, that's my uh, some, of, some of my experience. Uh, I also wanted to briefly introduce where I'm from and the uh, the, the power engineering program at my university, which is Clarkson University. Uh, the, the, the top left top figure is the where we are located. If you look at the Clarkson, it's in New York State. And indeed, um, people are always questioning, um, is in New York City or is where in New York? And I have been asked, asked this question a lot of times. And indeed, the Clarkson is in the upstate New York. Um, indeed, it's very close to the border between the US and Canada. Um, people from the Clarkson usually go to Ottawa or Montreal instead of go to New York City. Um, if you look at the distance, it's very obvious. And it takes us about one and a half hours to go to Ottawa. It takes uh, uh, about two hours to go to Montreal, but it takes us about six hours to go to New York City. So this is where Clarkson it is. Uh, this is the, uh, our campus in, in the summer. 
Um, we have a center. We established a power system engineering center in 2018. Currently, the core members we have we have five faculties uh, in power, the purely in power system, uh, pure uh, power engineering. We also have a, um, a coordinator because uh, the the center is funded by basically by the Clarkson in collaboration with the industry. Um, we have quite a lot of the members. Basically, we serve the industry in the northeast part of the country. Clarkson has a long history of power engineering. Uh, it's a strength for Clarkson, and we're trying to continue that route and want to use our expertise and experience to build a grid of the future. Um, that's basically the where we are, um, uh, where we are in the, my, uh, my experience. So now let's jump into some of the uh, information regarding the Generation Max in New Mexico. Because we, when we're trying to hit a target of 100% carbon free, we also need to know where we are. I quickly look, uh, look at the data from the Energy Information uh, Administration uh, that is a U US agent. It looks to me now uh, in New Mexico, um, the energy, the generation capacity composition, it looks like this. Uh, this data maybe is a little bit dated. Uh, the data seems that it's from 2019, but definitely that give us a good reflect of where we are in New Mexico for the generate electricity. Roughly 30% of capacity is from coal, it's coal. And the 37% is natural gas and the wind accounts for 23%, solar 80%. Um, uh, it looks to me that New Mexico is pretty dry and then the, the, the hydro is only less than 1%. This is based on the generation capacity. And then if you look at the electricity, um, electricity basically is energy from the energy perspective. The coal that generate 42% of electricity for New, York, uh, for New Mexico state. Uh, and uh, the natural gas generate about 34% of the electricity in New, York, uh, New Mexico state. The wind and the solar, the capacity wise, they have about 31%. But in terms of electricity, they account for 24% of electricity for, for New Mexico state. It definitely did very, um, it looks like we have a lot of work to do to really transform the grid from the where we are to 100% carbon free. One of the definitely one of the things we need to do is that get rid of the coal, coal uh, power the power plants there. That's you can do, look at that. Capacity wise, of 30%. The energy wise, of 40, 42%. That will lead to a dramatic change of the energy space. Um, people may also say the natural gas is also generating the carbon dioxide. In, so um, I look at the data, it seems like in currently in the US, about 62% of the natural gas, they are not equipped with the carbon capture technologies there. In other words, uh, during the transition to 100% carbon-free energy system, and other work we need to do is to really either you um, retire the gas power plants or you need to invest into the cap, uh, carbon capture to make sure that uh, natural gas will be carbon-free. With all of that, the, the need of the technology or the investment or the change of the generation max, and it's just another angle to show that we really, really need a lot of engineering for the great decarbonization in New Mexico. That has been also reflected by the, um, the goal, um, the goal for uh, New Mexico. It, I think the, the legislators set up the goal that by 2030, 50% uh, will be the electricity will be from the renewable and by 2045, and it should hit the target of 100%. Um, if you look at the um, currently the, the renewable composition in the US, uh, here is where we are. 
in the next few decades, this is where we will go to. Um, just one thing I want to point out here is, um, here is a percentage. In other words, if you look at the percentage now, the hydro is about 34% in the renewable Excuse yes. me, we have, we have a question. Sorry, I'm um, from Anthony Franklin. Why no nuclear? Um, you mean the nuclear for, for here? For, for, the, uh, for the renewable or the nuclear for the generation max? Um, Anthony, both. Okay, so this data, it seems that New Mexico does not have nuclear or nuclear is very small. That's what I, that's from the data from the EIA uh, uh, data there. And oh, okay. then- he says, he says he sees it now. Mm -hmm. And then that's a very good question. Indeed, I like that question. Why not nuclear? Indeed, currently nuclear is carbon neutral. You're right. And um, um, currently, I think in the U.S., we have about 10% uh, generation uh, electricity from nuclear. Uh, the nuclear has the challenge is for the larger scale nuclear and the flexibility is very, it, so basically nuclear is not flexible. And then they usually in the traditionally, we use a nuclear to serve the base load and also the waste of the nuclear power plants. It's all, always a, a concern. So for the larger scale nuclear uh, power plants, basically it's not our favored from the policy perspective. And also from the market perspective, I was saying, it's because the nuclear is serving the base load. In other words, the nuclear should be running constantly at an almost constant output. But because the generation system is transforming to a um, high penetration renewable driven uh, dominated, uh, energy system. The system will need a lot of flexibility, but the flexibility cannot be supplied by the nuclear. That created the challenge to maintain the secure operation of the power grid with high renewables. Now, in the, in the nuclear space, um, a lot of the momentum is trying to design a smaller uh, nuclear, it's more flexible. Um, uh, we call it the small scale, the nuclear um, technology. I will say the technology now is still in the development phase, has not really changed the game yet. Um, but I will envision if the small scale uh, nuclear power plants, the new technology will come into the, become mature, come into the market. I think the renewable uh, composition will be somehow be changed by that. Uh, but the condition is we have to have the mature technology and with a lot of flexibility to really um, accommodate the variability and the uncertainty of the renewable. I hope that answers your question. It did. He said, thank you. Uh, no more questions right now. Okay, great. Oh, <laughs> I forgot where where I was, but anyway, I will. Um, so you, if you look at the um, the renewable profile here, um, um, so in the next few decades, solar and wind will continue to ramp up. Um, hydro, I would say, hydro still consider a very key component for the renewable future. Uh, indeed, in New York State, we have about 24% of electricity from hydro. And uh, we are, uh, the New York Power Authority thinks hydro facilities will be a key enabler for New York to hit 100% uh, carbon free electricity grid. Um, so if you look at the, um, this is the, from the, the, the employment, um, this is the data is in 2019. Um, in the ele electric power generation employment, the employment increased by 4.8%. The transmission and the distribution storage uh, sector, the employment increased by 3.5%. This is just another angle to show that when we are uh, transforming the power grid, 
and the demand for workforce is definitely increasing. That makes a strong demand of power engineers or uh, engineers in the energy space. And then luckily I saw, I, I, I dig into the literatures, I saw one um, statistics for IEEE. So this is the IEEE transaction on power apparatus and the system. Basically that's the top one journal in the IEEE on power engineering. And I, I, I saw the New Mexico State, the, the name is here. Definitely, uh, this is a rigorous program. It's the fundamental to, to develop the, the workforce um, for the uh, New, New Mexico State or the country to really hit the target of 50% renewable by 2030 and 100% by 2045. Um, so when the power grid is, transform, is transformed into a you know, renewable dominated power grid, uh, another concern is a blackout. Uh, that has been um, the, 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 the effect of the blackout has been shown by the Texas blackout, you know, this year in the winter. But generally speaking, um, because of a blackout, it cost the US economy about more than $100 billion per year because of the outage. And also they have some statistics um, shows by each state, what's the annual business losses uh, from the grid problems. Uh, definitely from New, Max New Mexico is, uh, I would say is less impact um, by the outages or grid problems. Uh, but if you look at the uh, other state, like. California or Texas or Florida, Illinois or New, uh, New York, uh, we are highly impacted by outages or grid problems. Um, one, one example is Hurricane Sandy uh, in 2011. So if you look at Hurricane Sandy in 2011, uh, the New, New Jersey, and the, the whole the new, uh, northeastern part of the country has been hit pretty hard. Um, so we have a lot, a lot of people lost the electricity supply by that. And then the you know, outage uh, lasts for quite a few days. That has a, a very big impact on the energy policy for all, all the states here in the most eastern part. So the electricity, I usually say, electricity is usually like taken for granted until, until we are experiencing the blackouts. So the blackout is definitely is a very, very important topic um, when we are transforming the grid um, into the 100% renewable. Um, let me just quickly review what happened in the Texas blackout. From there, we can see why we have the blackout. What should we should do to really keep the lights on? So in February, 24, uh, February 14, 2021 to February, um, in the 19th, another time period, uh, the freezing cold weather hit the uh, Texas region, including New Mexico. If you look at the, 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 the map here, I'm pretty sure that maybe, you know, some of you experienced that extreme cold weather in the winter. Um, here is just a recap of what happened there. So on February 14, the air cup the, is a system operator uh, in Texas already seen that they already project that because the cold weather, they may experience the shortage of reserve. But they didn't project that there are so many generators tripped offline, including wind. Um, so this is what happened in the early morning of February uh, 15. And then at, so this is the 12, uh, 12, 12 a.m. They saw that the reserve is less than three gigawatt. And then they say, we need to do the energy conservation. But unfortunately, even you do the energy conservation, um, you can still not, you, you still cannot um, maintain the reserve margin there because the, the cold weather tripped off the gas power plants. So they, at 1.20 AM, they issued uh, emergency operation level three. That's the highest level. Basically, they said, 
there is no way for me to do anything to keep the lights on. I have to do the load shedding. So in that time, they do the rotating outage for almost 11 gigawatt load. 11 gigawatt load, that's a lot of customers. Um, I think the whole New Mexico, the peak load the probably is around, is about, is about this number. That means uh, you basically cut the power supply to whole New Mexico state and then doing a road, uh, doing a road, a road in black, uh, outage. So if you look at the, the generation, um, the outage due to the extreme cold weather there. So this is the uh, published by the aircraft, is the system operator to, uh, for the, uh, Texas. You can see that the, the scale here is gigawatt. Gigawatt is a huge number. Um, so the, four, the 15 and the 16, uh, around the 52 gigawatt generation tripped offline because the extreme cold weather. And then if you look at the composition, the majority the leading factor is natural gas and also wind. So I would say the wind definitely play a role here because the, the um, cold weather that lead to the uh, rolling blackout. If you look at some of the data here, in Texas, the peak demand is 75 gigawatt roughly. And then the, the whole, the, the total generation capacity they have is about 107 gigawatt. And then they have a generation outage at about 52 gigawatt. If you do a single map here, uh, using the 107 gigawatt minus 52 gigawatt, then you get about 55 gigawatt. So five, five, uh, 55 gigawatt generation definitely is way lower than your demand, right? So that's one of the key feature in power system. We almost need to keep the balance um, uh, between the generation and load to maintain the frequency. In other words, your generation is, is way short than the demand. Then they have to do the load shedding. So uh, in, that, in uh, February 15, the February 16, they shed about 20 gigawatt load um, to maintain the reliable operation of the grid. Um, if you look at the root cost, of the blackout is the insufficient generation to meet the demand due to extremely cold weather. But if you go deeper into that, if you go to read the report from the uh, air cut, it's because the cold weather makes the, um, the gas uh, delivery system not working. So your gas cannot be delivered to the uh, gas fired power plants. And the, um, the wind turbine does not have the, has the uh, winterization um, technologies, so they freeze out. They cannot generate electricity anymore. So extreme events or extreme cold weather definitely lead to the rolling blackout in Texas. 20 gigawatt load shedding is a lot. That's basically double the electricity, the demand in whole New Mexico state. Then we look at the 2020, the California the rolling blackout. Um, the root cause is, is, is totally opposite. In 2020, in the summer, um, the extreme heat wave um, had the Western coast and then including the California. Um, so California experienced the one, one in 30 years weather events. And then the climate change induced event heat wave really extended across the Western United States. Indeed, New Mexico is also impacted by the heat wave. So for the California, if you look at the load curve, so this is the load curve. And then you, you look at the peak here, definitely the load is larger than a typical year. Uh, because the high demand is from the heat wave. In the, in the meantime, the heat wave also, um, they, the heat wave also make the uh, thermal generators less efficient. We know that thermal generators, they uh, depends on the ambient temperature, uh, the efficiency and also the capacity, uh, the, max, the limitation, the generation limitation will be impacted by the ambient temperature. Generally speaking, the thermal generators 
they can their the limitation a megawatt limitation will be larger in winter, but it's less in the summer because the the higher ambient temperature, and also because the uh, the heat wave and then you have the smokes and the solar generation uh, is decreased, and then also like California experienced the drought. They don't have sufficient hydro generation. So it's a lot of factor lead to the rolling blackout in Texas. Um, the, if we summarize it, it is, it's the imbalance between the generation and the load. The heat wave increased the demand and also decreasing the generation. That leads to the rolling blackout in Texas. If we summarize the two uh, running blackouts in Texas, in, in California, you can see that. Um, in Texas, they have 52 gigawatt generation is offline. And the California solar generation decreased, gas turbine decreased, load increase for both the scenarios. And uh, the impact is a lot, uh, 4.5 4 million in Texas houses are lost the power. And in, in California, roughly one gigawatt load, um, load shedding are, uh, was executed. And then the impact, the Texas one is up to four days outage for some of the customers, but the California, um, the outage was um, less. So, but people will say, you know, we pay a lot of electricity bills. We, we make sure that system has sufficient generation to meet the demand. That is, should be done, should be planned in the design of the power grid. Why? we have not prevent this kind of blackouts. Or say, if we have a blackout, what should we do? Indeed, I have to claim that the engineering practice for the energy system are really, really challenged by the extreme events to keep the lights on. In other words, the engineering practice in the power industry has not considered all the scenarios that uh, of the energy system, all the scenario, including the extreme events or cascading failures of a power grid. So that's, a, that's the, uh, the practice. Indeed, if we can say we can always, always improve the engineering practice. That's right. And how to improve the engineering practice and also considering the cost, that's another thing we need to keep in mind. The, how to design and operate the grid in a more cost-effective way to keep the lights on while hitting the target of 100% carbon-free. That is our goal. Um, if you look at the um, historically the blackouts in the US, uh, I just listed some of very typical, I would say signature blackouts in the US history. Um, the most famous one, I would say one of the most famous one is was 1965. That's the Northeastern blackout. Indeed, New York was heavily impacted by this. Uh, that's almost uh, four or five decades ago. 30 million customers are affected. Indeed, because of this blackout, that led to the installation of a remote terminal unit. That's the substation um, measurement sensors and also energy management system. Energy management system is for the trans a bulk power system, uh, management system um, in the control room. Yeah. So what is, because of blackout, people realize that we need to have more visibility into the grid operation. So that's one of the um, very signature blackout in the US history. Now we look at the 2003 Northeastern blackout. That blackout caused about 45 million uh, customer lost electricity. That drives to further investment into the grid. People, uh, the industries, want to have more visibility into the grid. What a concept. And they, they put a lot of investment into the phase management unit. That is about two decades ago. Now we look at the um, 2011, 2012. In that time period, the US has been impacted by a lot of hurricanes, extreme events like hurricanes and, and, and uh, uh, thunderstorm like that. And then about th that impact, so the, you, I will say this blackout or related to transmission grid. But in, in roughly one decade ago, that extreme events have impact the distribution grid. 
about 4.2 million people are affected. And then one decade ago, people bring the resiliency into our table and say, we really, really need to, need to design a resilient power grid. And then the 20, uh, 20 and the 21, now we have the control blackouts, about 4.2 million customers are affected. And then what will come out from this? We need to see. But I'm pretty sure um, the renewable, somehow uh, when we are doing the transition of the power grid into 100% renewable, we need to keep the blackouts into our mind. And how can we keep the lights on when we do the energy transformation? So I, I always call the blackouts, it's a wake up call for a change of grid, especially the change of a policy, change of a NERC standard, change of the engineering practice for us. Um, if you look at the, the root cause of blackout, uh, there are so many reasons to cause the blackout. Uh, in the Texas, in California, it's the extreme cold weather, extreme, the, extreme the hot weather. Um, if we categorize that into the top 10 root cause of black house there or outages there, the number one is a natural disaster, including the extreme cold or hot weather as we talk about. The second root cause is the motor vehicle accident. So basically someone uh, hit the pole um, and knocked down the, the, uh, the, the, the power line. That caused the, black, uh, caused the outage. Um, and also, the third one is the equipment failure. Basically, I need to say that in the US, the power grid was, uh, was designed and built was the majority of probably was uh, in 1960s or 70s, from 50s, 60s and 70s in that three decades. So the transmission line has been there for 50 years. The power plants, I would say power plants probably is fairly newer, but the transformers, and the uh, uh, transmission lines have been there for a few decades. The average transmission uh, transformers in the transmission grid, the average age is about 27 years. Just imagine how old they are. Uh, basically, your father designed the power grid. Now you are still using the, the same power grid your father designed. But that, all, all of that, no matter is the natural disasters, it's the uh, motor vehicle accidents or equipment failures or it's, it's a falling trees, no matter what. So usually the system operators is sitting at the control room. They don't know what is going on there. They don't understand, they, 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 they don't know if you are experience, experiencing an outage until you notify the system operator, either by calling them say, I have an outage. You know, you need to take some action to fix it. Or some, the, some sensors at your house can detect there is an outage and then send a notification to the control room to notify the system operator that you have a power outage. So no matter what, what the root cause it is, the system, system operators relies on the technology to estimate where the outage is where the problem is, for example, if there is a foul or if there is a, uh, the, the pole locked down, they need to predict what, where the problem is so they can dispatch the crew to patrol and you know, to come here on site to fix it. So we call that as outage management. Um, before I go on, I just want to see, uh, uh, Isis, do you see any questions? No questions at this time. All right, um, feel free to ask your questions and I will be more than happy to answer any question there, if there is. So here, I just wanted to you know, go into some of the uh, technology that I have been working on. Um, the, the first part is outage management of the electrical power distribution systems. Um, when I'm talking about the distribution grid, the outage management, basically when you have a power outage, either you call, you pick up your phone call to to, to notify the, um, the system operator saying you have an outage or the smart meter at your house will report an outage. Um, I need to talk about the, the currently in the US, the energy meters we are using. So energy meters are nothing new. 
but depends on the technology, we have three categories. One is the, uh, the traditional matter, we, we call it the standard meter. Uh, about 2000, um, the automation, um, we try to increase the automation in the, into the power grid. And then roughly in 2000, we started in the US, we started to deploy the AMR. It's called an automatic meter reading, meter. But that is not a smart meter. And then in the last decade, we have seen a lot of installation of smart meters. Compared to different technologies, basically the standard meter need, uh, the, the utility will need, need to come dispatch some, uh, some people here to come into your uh, backyard to read the meters, how much energy you consume every month. That's manually, basically we call it a manual meter. The AMR meter basically is auto, it called automatic meter reading. Uh, what they do is uh, they have the one-way communication. Now, instead of coming to your backyard, they just need to drive a car along the road and to pin your meter and to read the energy consumption or detect if there's any issue or outage in your house. Now the smart meter is, we call it a smart because you have the two-way communication. It has more um, capability. They, they, they report the data energy consumption every 15 minutes or every hour. Uh, beyond that, if your house experiences an outage, it can send a notification to the system operator automatically. Uh, I look it up, the, the profile the, in New Mexico State. Currently, uh, the majority of your customer in New Mexico State is still the standard meter. That's about account for about 62%. And then about 12% of the customers is using the smart meters. Uh, this number is for the US, roughly about, now I think about 100 million smart meters has been installed in the US. So because of the smart meters, you can see that now the system operators has the visibility into the residential or commercial. So basically in the customer's energy consumption because of the data. Originally, the standard meter can give you the manually give you the data, one data point per month. Now the smart meter gives the data every 15 minutes. So the meter, uh, I think the, 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 the volume of the data is, is hundreds, uh, it's tens of hundreds, uh, tens to hundreds uh, times the data volume. So that data gives you more information. So my research, um, for, on this topic is trying to use the smart meter data to help the outage management. In other words, we use the smart meter data to help the system operators to infer where the problem is. Say the, the paw that knocked it down or the uh, squirrel like, uh, you know, jump into the, the, the lines there to create a shortage, whatever. And then if you look at the, uh, this is the distribution grid. Uh, this is the schematics. Um, so you, this is a substation, you know, the, uh, from the substation, you, you know, from the feeders, you go to the, the fuses for protection, then you go to the distribution transformers, they serve the house. If there's an outage, for example, if there is um, there's a file here, then you trip open the uh, recloser. Then all the customers downstream will experience the outage. Then the smart meters will report the outage, uh, send a notification to the system operator. The system operator using that notification try to infer uh, where the fault is and what happened there. So the question is that, how do you use the meter data to infer the audit scenario? Also, I need to note that in addition to the smart meters we have, along the feeder level, we also have remote fault indicators. We also have the uh, automatic reclosers like that. So the feeder level sensor together with the smart meter, how did you use the data? To, uh, for the decision making for the system operator. So I, um, if you look at the um, uh, the audit management issue, then you need to you don't know what happened in the, uh, the scenario. You try to uh, infer the most credible audit scenario uh, supported by the evidence, the meter data there, and then you also need to constrain the, the physical uh, rules. The physical rules means basically considering the physical property of your system. For example, your protection is coordinated. Basically, when there is a fault downstream of the protection, your protection is expected to activate. You also want, uh, 
has the other constraint saying the fault indicators send the notifications only when the fault indicator is upstream of the fault the fault location like that. And then you give all the all the constraints, you try to infer using the data from the meters, either the small meters or the feeder level meters, you try to infer which outage scenario of the fault location and also the activated protection is the most credible. But indeed, that is, you, you don't know what happened there. You don't know the ground truth. But what you can do is purely data-driven or evidence-driven, try to infer the scenarios there. So in the optimization perspective, you put an objective function, you put a lot of constraints there, you try to solve the opti uh, optimization. But indeed, because you don't know how many files are there, if there is, if any meter is, uh, is uh, failed or any meter malfunctioned. In, in other words, you don't know the uncertainty of the meter uh, data. Then we propose using the hypothesis testing. In other words, I don't know what it, or how many issues are there in the system. I can put a hypothesis, assume how many issues are there. For each of the assumed scenario, we run the optimization, try to improve the efficiency of the analytic model. So the analytic model is the challenge is that we, we the, a lot of non-linearity non and also computational complexity and the local optimality. And then we propose using the multiple hypothesis methodologies. So you generate a hypothesis, you collect all the evidence from the smart meters or feeder level meter data. Uh, together, you design the optimization model. Consider all the constraints, your remote file indicators should be about, uh, upstream of the file location. Your um, smart meter audit report should be downstream of the activated uh, protections there, like that. And then you run the optimization model. You, uh, for each of the hypotheses, you determine, you calculate the credibility of this hypothesis. In other words, you, you try to rank the credibility for each hypothesis. Then using the credibility, you infer which audit scenario is the most credible, supported by the evidence you connected from the smart meters or other sensor. Uh, sensors along the, uh, the feeder. Now we tested this, uh, the, the technology uh, using the, the real world feeders. Uh, this is from the, um, the, the Washington State. Um, uh, this is the simplified schematics of that. And then we have the scenarios there. Uh, we, uh, we generate eight hypotheses. For each hypothesis, we run the optimization. We determine the which device protection activated, where the fault is, we calculate how many smart meters are aligned with the determined outage scenarios and uh, the credibility. We can see that for this one, for the other hypo hypothesis, we can see that different hypotheses will have, are, have different credibility, credibility. We rank the credibility, we find the most credible one. Using that hypothesis result to infer the outage scenarios, so basically we infer what happened in the outage using the data. This is a very in line with what we do in the distribution graph. We have the distribution management system. We use the data. We leverage the data. We try to infer what happened. We call it data analytics in the power system. Um, so this is the distribution graph for transmission. For transmission, uh, I would say it's, it's very similar but the transmission is way more complex than the distribution. If you look at this transmission, transmission basically the transmission line in the substations. In the substation, because of the substation automation, we have a lot of sensors installed into the substation. That include the digital relays, the uh, phaser management units, and then other IEDs, like all the meters there. And then for transmission, the protection, uh, principle is totally different because the transmission grid is way more complex. Um, for each of the components in power system, we have a dedicated protection scheme to protect the component. The reason is one transmission transformers will cost you quite a number of million dollars. So 
if there is any event, I say there is a fault within the transformer, you want to trip open the circuit breaker to isolate the transformer transformers as soon as possible. Usually that is done within one or two seconds. So that it, we have a very soft, um, you know, dedicated protection to protect a grid asset there. So usually for transmission grid, uh, for grid asset, we have the main protection, this, uh, the primary backup protection, secondary back, back, uh, backup protection, breaker failure protection. All the purpose is trying to isolate the fault as soon as possible and considering the abnormality and, and security of your protection schemes. So at the substation, you have the PMUs, you have other um, device IEDs, the like digital relays. You also have the sequential event recorder that basically to try to record what happened in the substation. Uh, did your uh, digital relay trip? Did your uh, circuit op uh, breaker open? Did your PMU that record the data like that? They all were recorded in the sequential uh, event recorder. Now the problem is how the front the system operator, we don't have, we don't have um, engineers in every substation. The system operators in the control room, they rely on the alarms or the data from the sensors to infer what happened, which transmission line fouled it, which protections it's uh, tripped open like that. So they use the, they use the data, using the data analytics um, technology plus the domain knowledge of power engineering, try to infer what happened there. We call the event the diagnosis for transmission. So basically you have the grid data, you have sensor data, you're considering all the domain knowledge of the protection and the system there. You try to infer where, uh, which component is faulted, where is the failure of the uh, circuit breaker, if there is any failure or malfunction of the relays, or if there is a missing or incorrect alarms like that. So we call that event diagnosis. Um, so there, here is just one example. Uh, a fault that happens in line three, and then uh, this circuit breaker keep trip it open, but this circuit breaker did not. Instead, the second secondary uh, backup protection at location, uh, circuit breaker one, circuit breaker two, circuit breaker 15, the circuit breaker 12, they trip it open to answer the fault. Then this is the event, this is this um, alarm that we get. And then using the analytic model there, we infer what happened there. Uh, at what time the, the fault occurs and uh, at which component is faulted, uh, which protection relay tripped open or failed, and uh, is there any other time tag issues with circuit breaker like that? So what we've done for here is uh, we propose the analytic model to handle the complex scenarios with the abnormalities. But then, um, give it a time, I will, I will go a little bit quick here. As what if the cascading events lead into a system-wide black house? In other words, what if your uh, abnormality or fouls has not been isolated by the protection or the, uh, the, the issues propagate into the grid, in the, in the grid? That is what exactly happened in 2003, widespread blackout. Um, so when we have a widespread blackout, what do we need to do? We call it a power system restoration. What, are, what is a power system restoration? Basically, you have some dedicated Black Star units. You use that Black Star unit. You try to crank the, the network and also the generators. You try to restore, bring back the transmission line and also the generators back into normal operation um, step by step. So we call it the generator restoration, system restoration, not load restoration. If you look at the, the pictures, basically, you are using one of uh, the dedicated generation unit, we call it a black star unit. You try to crank the network step by step. We call it the restoration there. And then indeed that effort was from the 2003, the, uh, the widespread blackout. And then APRI was uh, put some initiative to design the software there. Uh, it takes a long time to really design, uh, develop the tools there. Indeed, one of the tool is designed by I, I wouldn't say to, purely by me, but started from me. And um, now uh, they tested, uh, they work with the, um, the utilities uh, across the world for, for this technology. I do have a, a small uh, video here to, um, to, to show, it, it's a, a small, a very quick clip to show that the tool here. Uh, but it's not a tool, it's more about the background. 
why we need to do that, how the force is helping the industry. To Restoring power to the electric grid after a total shutdown. This ability to black start the grid is something all grid operators plan and practice for, and it's one capability they hope to never use. A black start involves using designated power plants, known as black start units, that can start without the help of the grid. As these units return to service, grid operators methodically connect electric load and other generators to restore the system through prescribed steps. While the concept of a black start has generated oh, sorry discussion following the extreme winter weather impacts in Texas, restoring electric service in the state did not require a black start. That's because the grid is designed to withstand disturbances without leading to a blackout. Grid operators must anticipate and mitigate a number of scenarios, from severe weather, to natural disasters, to cyber attacks, to an electromagnetic pulse. The Electric Power Research Institute works with utilities around the world to harden their systems, plan to mitigate the impacts of extreme events, and expedite power restoration. While some estimated that restoring the Texas system from Black Start could have taken months, the Black Start of a de-energized but functional energy system would have taken a matter of hours, or, at most, a few days. EPRI's approach to Black Start planning consists of two primary components. EPRI's optimal Black Start capability tool finds the best location of Black Start resources, those that power on first, as well as the sequencing across the grid to restore priority loads and non-Black Star generators. This identifies the ideal Black Star strategy, assuming all resources are available. As the circumstances... So given the time, I will not... Oh, I should stop sharing the screen, sorry. Um, given the time, I will not go to the details of the, all the videos here. Um, so, so this is basically the tool, and also we tested the tool like using the uh, Duke Energy Systems. There's some results there. Uh, given the time, I will not go to too much details here. But then when we are looking about the transformation of the grid into the future, and then we, we are really have the challenges here. In addition to the challenges that we have been talking about in the last decade, no inertia from the renewable variability and the uncertainty from the renewables, I think, the most challenging one is engineering, engineering practice and the controllers in the system now, currently we have. They are all based on the conventional generator resources. So that create, I will say, the most challenging part for the transformation of the grid. Um, now, this is the, uh, some of the, um, uh, the look, yeah, sorry. Dr. John, it looks like we actually have a question from Anthony. Um, what is, um, and so I was gonna interject because you have two minutes left. Maybe you can use the two minutes to answer uh, questions. Did that work for mm -hmm. you? Yes. Okay, because um, this has been a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Um, Anthony's question is, um, what are the biggest obstacles currently facing you in your work? And what are some of the future challenges you anticipate? Right, I think that's a fantastic question. I think the challenge one is how do you understand the value of the data now from the grid? And the, the, this, uh, understand the value. And then the second is that, how do you design the technology that are based on the, the data combined with the domain knowledge to really untap the value of the data? Uh, for me, one of the challenges is that I, Sometimes I cannot get really the, the data that I want for my study. Uh, but um, from the technology perspective, the challenge is how did you design the technology to really take the challenge there, uh, faced by the grid? Awesome. Uh, what a succinct and on point answer. Thank you. Um, this has been an absolutely fantastic presentation. I, um, there are not enough people in academia that present like you do. So thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for being here. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna quick close this out um, since I don't see any other questions and take over the screen so I can show this. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you again, Dr. We've got someone in the, okay, cool. Um, Thank you, Dr. John, once again, for being so generous with your time. Um, this is an absolutely fascinating topic and 
one that's, as you know, at the core of our project's research mission. So this presentation was quite a treat for us. And, and for those of us who are non-experts in the field, it was fantastic. Um, before we sign off, I just want to thank my partner in crime and Dr. Wong for suggesting Dr. John as a webinar speaker because it was fantastic. It's fantastic, sorry. Um, so thank you, thank you for presenting. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for all the students who attend or faculty that attend this seminar. I, if you look, you have, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out, and then you can easily look at look up my information on the website, and I will be more than happy to uh, keep the conversation going there and keep in, in 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 touch with you. Yay! This has been a great day. Thank you so much, and don't forget everybody to join us again in August for Python Fundamentals Data Analysis and Visualization with Dustin Allen. Um, until next time, have a great, great afternoon, everybody.